guys, it's Alex Riley. Welcome back to the hand of the day. Today's hand comes from the European Poker Tour um, main event, and I was at the feature table with Daniel DeGrano. This is probably the hand I get asked about the most, so I figured I'd make a video about it because um, the hand is super interesting, and I think the thought process of both of us is uh, it's pretty cool in this one as well. So the blinds are 100, 200. Daniel raises in second position to 400. Uh, min raise. He's, he has about 65 big blinds, uh, which even though he's the shortest stack at the table, is still a ton of chips. So I go ahead and call to his left with two fives. Um, Dario San Martino calls with uh, two threes, and we get the small blind of the big blind in the pot as well. So we're five way to the flop, to the flop, to the flop. The flop comes queen five two with five two of clubs. Gin for me, I flop a set, um, pretty much the nuts here. And uh, checks to Daniel, he bets 1150. So I have a few options here. Of course, I could call or raise. And I opted to raise here, and I made it 2,500, and I will tell you why. I think that raising is better because Daniel represents a ton of strength by leading here. And I don't really want to, A, I don't think he's gonna fold if he has something like what he's representing, which is ace queen, king queen, uh, maybe he has a queen with a flush draw, maybe he has the nut flush draw, or maybe he has aces or kings. He's never gonna fold any of those hands, and uh, I think raising here is the best play. I just get it in with Daniel and um, you know run, run it out, try and win the pot. I don't like calling here because I think that if one of my opponents flopped the flush draw, they pretty much have direct odds to call here. They're not making a mistake by calling. So if I just call here and either Dario, the small blind or the big blind uh, has a flush draw, they're gonna be correct to call because against my hand, um, I don't really want a flush draw or four five in the pot because I mean, or 3-4 in the pot, or ace-3 in the pot, or something like that, just because if they hit, I'm gonna be in a really tough spot, it's hard to get away from my hand, and uh, they have direct odds to call, so I want them to make a mistake by calling. And if I do raise here, another thing is that if someone else has the nut flush draw, or a queen with a flush draw, they're not gonna fold anyway. So, raising here doesn't really change the times I get the money in the pot, and it only hurts me when someone else has something that I don't want them to have. So I go ahead and raise, uh, and Daniel calls. When he did that, I didn't think he had three of a kind. I thought maybe he has just like a queen, or he could even have a hand like a pair of tens. I know that he likes to play a lot of hands, and uh, he doesn't really like to fold the raises, so I'm not su super shocked that he called, especially because I think he has what he's representing, which is a huge hand. My plan against him was if a club came on the turn, I was gonna go ahead and try to pile drive my way through this hand and just bluff him. Now at this point, I think he has like a queen, king queen or queen jack, something he's a little, not too excited about getting it in with, but or maybe he even has aces and he wants to see a blank turn and he's planning on getting it in then. Anyway, I'm loving my hand, a great spot for me. So we go heads up to the turn. The turn is the jack of clubs. So now I actually made a pair of jacks and I have the nut flush draw. A terrible card for me. It either completes his hand to a hand that's better than mine or it kills my action because he's never gonna go broke now with two aces and um, because it's so likely that I either have a set or a flush draw, both of which now beat his hand. It's really hard for me to be bluffing here on the flop because I'm never really gonna bluff with four players behind me when Daniel leads into uh, the whole field. So not a good card for me uh, for a myriad of reasons, but um, now Daniel goes ahead and leads. So rather than check to him, I decided to take the lead here because my plan was to set it up so I could bet the turn and then move all in on the river. He bets 3,100 and so I'm faced with a really tough spot. I don't think that Daniel, I, you really have to ask yourself, you know, what hands is Daniel gonna play this way? So how could he have even gotten to the turn in the hand in the first place? For him to raise pre-flop, bet the flop, and then call a raise on the flop, he is signifying a lot of strength. There's not many bluffs that he could possibly have. It's very hard for him to be bluffing, given out what action he took. And uh, now when he bets again, it's, you know, he's really representing something like the nut flush or any flush, but um, particularly the nut flush. So I decide to call. I still think that there's, of course, I'm going to stack him if the board pairs on the river. I do have a ton of implied odds. I'm always going to win all of his chips on the river if the board pairs. So that's one reason I'm calling. I, I do have implied odds if I hit my hand. Another reason is that I'm not 100% sure on B. He could be betting with something like Queen Jack or Aces, um, Aces with a club to sort of protect his hand slash, you know, picked up a draw on the turn. He doesn't want me to check behind and risk um, catching up with something that I had, a stupid hand that I was raising with on the flop. So I think that Daniel's capable of betting here, whereas 
you know, a lot of people aren't going to ever bet this turn. And I think Daniel's capable of betting both with hands for value that, that I beat and, and, and strong hands. I don't really put any bluffs in his range because I just don't see it possible that he could have called the flop with, with nothing. And the river comes an offsuit ace. Now that's an easy card for me to play. It's a terrible card for me. I've made aces up. Because now there's pretty much nothing I beat. If he's got me beat with ace queen or three of a kind, then so be it. And he moves all in. We could be about to lose Daniel Negreanu. Sick part is he thinks he's value betting. Seven. Daniel goes all in, which is, of course, terrible. I move in my last bit of chips and he starts thinking about it. And I'm hemming and hawing, debating what to do. And ultimately he talks as though he folded three of a kind. I don't know that I believe him, really. I end up folding, and this is why. The pot's 20,000, I have to call 7,000, so I'm getting a great price. I only need to be right 25% of the time to successfully call here. But if you add up all the possibilities of hands that Daniel could have that are bluffs, and all the hands he could have for value, I just don't think that 25% of the time I'm gonna win. In other words, I don't think that 25% of his hands are bluffs. I think that more than 80 or 90 percent of the time he's value betting and I just don't think I could justify calling here. It's like I want a fold. Really? You have a what? I want a fold. You don't have a fold? No, I want to fold. So the question you have to ask yourself is what possible bluffs can he be having? What possible hands can he call the flop with and then be bluffing? It's really hard to do. Ace Queen of Hearts might get half. <laughs> <laughs> Go for the high, take the low. <laughs> so actually on the river, I really thought that aces were a big part of the possibility of hands he has, um, or of course the knight flush. Um, but either of those, both of those hands I don't beat, of course. Um, so I really just don't see any hand I beat, and gotta give credit to Daniel here. He definitely bluffed with the only possible hand he could be bluffing with. You need to have the ace of clubs in your hand to do this successfully. Uh, in order to make sure that your opponent doesn't have the ace of clubs. So credit to him for, for successfully pulling it off and uh, he played it great. My play would have worked irregardless of whether or not the ace came because I was trying to represent a flush and I'm hoping that he bought it and apparently he did. You gotta give Daniel a ton of credit here. Even though calling the flop out of position to bluff later on is a little ambitious, you have to realize that in this situation, it's never a spot where someone expects someone else to be bluffing. And so I'm a little flattered that Daniel would be would be sure enough that I would fold to consider making this play. Because in order to make this play successfully, you have to know that your opponent is going to successfully deduce the hand and know that you're very unlikely to be bluffing here. So I am a little flattered, but a ton of credit to Daniel here for taking advantage of a situation in poker where nobody ever bluffs. So that is what really led me to fold in this hand. The fact that nobody ever bluffs here um, kind of dumbfounded me. And I was like, well, it's impossible for him to be bluffing. I'm gonna fold. But the key to success in poker is taking advantage of the spots that are too infrequently um, exploited today. So Daniel did that, credit to him. Great play, it turned out to work. But I still think that, uh, that folding is right just because so often you're gonna be shown the nuts, right? Someone always has the nuts there. That's it for the hand of the day. If you want your hand submitted, uh, reach out to me, subscribe to my blog on alexrelly.com and um, respond to the welcome email. You could send me your hands of poker or questions about poker or lifestyle in general and I will respond to the best ones and make you guys a video. Thanks for watching, see you next Here's week. Show you one card, that's good. Let's see. Wow, what a card, right? The obvious can't be bluffing card. Show the ace of clubs.